Hello, everyone, and welcome to Public Health Plus Communications, Changing the Narrative. My name is Michelle James, and I'm the Senior Director of Alumni Engagement at Emory University's Rollins School of Public Health. Today's panel discussion will focus on how public health narratives shape outcomes and what we can learn from these narratives, successes, and failures. Today's discussion is a continuation of the Public Health Plus series, which is a partnership between the Rollins School of Public Health at Emory and Orange Sparkle Ball. It is meant to highlight the reach of public health across all sectors and help inform the next generation of public health professionals. I'm excited at this time to hand off the session to our facilitator, Sophie Becker. Thank you, Michelle. I'm Sophie Becker. I'm a design innovation strategist at Orange Sparkle Ball, and I will be facilitating this conversation. With me, we have three fantastic guests who I am very excited and honored to talk to today. We have Dr. Samson Barris, a clinical psychologist who originated the Housing First model to address homelessness. Dr. Sambaris serves as the CEO for Pathways Housing First Institute and is a clinical associate professor at UCLA's Department of Psychiatry and Biobehavioral Sciences. We also have Dr. Cynthia Gomez, who is the founding director of the Health Equity Institute at San Francisco State University. She previously served as the co-director for the Center of AIDS Prevention Studies at the University of California at San Francisco and has been a leading scientist in HIV prevention research since the 1990s. We also are joined by Nancy Weaver, Dr. Nancy Weaver, who is a professor of behavioral science and health education at St. Louis University's College for Public Health and Social Justice. She is teaching the next generation of public health professionals all about public health communications, in addition to conducting her own research in the world of caregiving and child wellness. Thank you all for being with me today. And I know I just gave really quick introductions to each of you, but I would love to hear in your own words um, the areas that you work in, how you would define that space and your roles within it. Um, so Cynthia, would you lead us off? Sure, hello everybody, uh, pleasure to be here. So um, my current area is really continuing my work in health equity, um, although I am retired from the academy. Um, so my focus has really been more broadly to start working with community organizations, nonprofit organizations, uh, really at the systemic level. What, what are the needs of our systems that serve um, our communities? And so working a lot with board governance issues and structures that will help organizations be more effective. Um, and then also working in pipelines, um, doing a lot of mentoring of young professionals um, that I'm excited to see are wanting to de dedicate their lives to public health um, and other areas uh, serving individuals and communities. So really uh, those are my areas at the moment, although still doing a lot of uh, general HIV, reproductive health, sexual health, research type things, uh, but not not formally anymore as I did before. Thank you, Nancy. Hi, thanks for having me. This is such a fun conversation. I think what was really interesting in the, in the world of COVID about the public health response is that we started hearing lots of personal stories and, and the importance of narrative was really elevated during that time. And I met with lots of parent groups and teacher groups and, and people really on the front lines of the public health response and realizing really quickly that if we just took a minute to talk about people's fears and what they valued and what they were afraid of and, and really understood the lived experience of everyone who's involved, it allowed us to be very mindful um, in, in our work. And so my area in particular is in parenting and child wellness specifically. And, and so thinking about where we find ourselves now as a society, having gone through what has been pretty traumatic for a lot of people involved, how do we think about those stories as they apply to teachers and school administrators and parents? And what can we learn from those narratives about the way our brains are responding to this trauma so that we can be really more effective in our public health approach. And so I really love this conversation about narrative 
because that's really important as we consider the data and epidemiology and the cross tabs and logistic regressions that we're also putting that in the lens of, of the humans and our connections with each other. So that's kind of the space I've been playing in for a while. Thanks, Nancy. Sam? Hi, everyone. Great to be here. Uh, great to be with you. The area that I've uh, focused on primarily uh, last uh, few decades has been homelessness, people experiencing homelessness, uh, mostly individuals, especially uh, individuals who also have a diagnosis of uh, mental illness or addiction, because of my, my interest in homelessness started through psychology. You could, but uh, it's expanded because the homeless population also includes about half families, meaning single parent moms with younger kids and, and also young people, people leaving youth, uh, running away from home, leaving uh, foster care for youth. So homelessness and the, the issue of narrative around homelessness is, is a huge issue because typically the people we're talking about, people experiencing homelessness are the least likely to be defining their own narrative. And so they are, they tend to be, for example, people on the street that we pass and, and most of the public thinks of homelessness as that solitary individual on the street, which is only a fraction of them, but that's in the public mind, homelessness. And then people define homelessness as um, either the person is there because they're, they're choosing to be, or they're there because of their mental illness. The attributions and the narratives that are imposed on the person who's homeless then create public health and public policy responses based on those narratives. So if you're assuming the person is there because they have made bad mistakes or are not able to take care of themselves, you would introduce a rather... Uh, strict or even coercive measures to get people off the street. There are laws against staying on the street. There are laws about involuntary commitment. But if you assume the person is there because of structural factors, economic factors, uh, high rents, uh, racism, discrimination, disability benefits too low to afford housing, then your interventions are aimed towards creating more public housing, support services for those who need it, so the battle for the narrative for this population is hugely important and continues to be fought today in terms of how are we gonna deal with homelessness? As a nation, we're not really of one mind about that. Thanks, Sam. So I think Sam, you were getting kind of really to the point of what your ideal narrative is in the space you work at. Um, but Cynthia, Nancy, I'd be really curious if you could kind of draw a line between what the current narrative is in these spaces you're working in and what your ideal narrative is instead. Sure, I, um, you know, in, in my world of health equity, I think part of the narrative, and, and I'll speak to both HIV and health equity because those have been so, so much a part of my life and the narratives I've been dealing with, um, but in, in health equity, for me, the concern is that people perceive sort of a zero sum game um, in that narrative, meaning that for us to achieve equity or health equity in particular, that we have to take something away from others to meet the needs of those that might have greater needs. And, and it's simply not correct. Um, you know, really trying to move that to the ideal sort of win-win narrative. Um, if, if we are making sure that everyone has the same opportunities for health, we're all going to benefit from that. There, there is that win-win. So really trying to change that narrative. Um, I wanna say though that similarly to Sam, however, in HIV, it's about it, it, it was about the blame game. And I think that that's something that for some reason, we as a society have done for quite some time. If, if we misbehave, um, it, there'll be consequences. And um, that was how HIV was perceived, that, it, you know, there must be something you did that was bad, therefore you're bad. Um, and, um, you know, we see that in a lot of our narratives is uh, there must be sort of that individual, you're lazy, you're this, you're that, um, as opposed to what have we as a society done that prevents certain individuals to struggle more than others. 
I think that's a really interesting um, framing. You know, Sam mentioned, you know, we're battling for the narrative and you, Cynthia, you referenced the blame game. And I see that a lot in how we're thinking about child wellness now. Um, it, it's, and it's, and it's troubling because think about the kids showing up at school who are being disruptive. Um, sometimes they're being disruptive because it's their nervous system that's responding to what they think of as a threat. And for kids to withdraw or be disruptive, those are coping mechanisms. And if we watch that disruptive kid and we think that the way to address that is punishment and taking their phone away or detention, and we're not aware that that's a nervous system response to a threat, we're not going to solve the problem because we're fo we're focusing on the wrong on the wrong antecedent if you will and then we start pointing fingers well they're not learning this at home you parents do something oh well they're not learning it at school you teachers do that that's not my job that's your job and then our constellation of risk factors just like escalates and we have um what one of the respondents i talked to called a tinderbox of stress um, so I, I like the importance of the narrative for that because it allows us to sort of step back and listen, really, really listen with a curious and non-judgmental lens to sort of what those stressors are and, and be willing to be vulnerable in, in doing that. Then we can find real solutions. So something you were all getting at is kind of this idea of the individual versus systematic or societal or external factors and kind of the conflicting narratives there. And I fully acknowledge this is not a small question to ask, but why do you think that is so persistent and continues, even though we kind of acknowledged, oh, it's not just individuals. Why does that narrative persist? Well, I think, you know, some, some examples that I think of really start by us acknowledging our own expectations. Um, I think that, for example, in in the health professions, um, you know, we have given the power, if you will, to the medical profession to tell us what's right and what's wrong. And in many ways, um, you know, any person will tell you that the knowledge we gain through research and science is really a an iterative process. And so we often start with messages that we know to be true at that moment um, until we gain new knowledge and then have to change that narrative. And that change, I think, creates mistrust uh, because there's this assumption that we were somehow miscommunicating before. And we haven't been able to sort of help folks understand with some of this messaging that is, that it, that that science is is a um, a testing ground. That is what it is, um, and that our tests are going to continue to give us new information that will change that narrative. So I think we're it, it's a bit of a for me that's part of the problem is that we're not as honest from the beginning about how vulnerable our knowledge is, um, and that in fact many things can change the basis of our knowledge. And how do we do it in such a way? that creates credibility at the same time as not creating the absolute, you know, this is the absolute knowledge and it will never change sort of perception. So that's just one angle. I really like that angle um, because I also think in addition to having very immature knowledge and understanding the way knowledge builds, we've also attached ideology to knowledge and one thing that we are not very good at doing is debating and arguing and critically analyzing arguments and looking for the the unintended consequences and the third and or third and fourth order effects of policies. And we had very blunt instruments we were using and blunt instruments aren't always very good and they're really hard to explain to people. So as new knowledge is generated, we had a hard time pivoting and incorporating that new knowledge, particularly because we don't really have a platform for honest debate about what the pros and cons of each of our strategies were at the time. Well, I, I, 
I love the way this conversation is going. And Jump in here, Sam. I, yeah, I just have to say, I have to say that um, there, there are a couple of things that also occur to me in this, and it was actually an earlier statement that Cynthia made about individualism. You know, this knowledge and information we're talking about is not values free. We are a culture deeply embedded in individualism. And so, you know, we celebrate individualism when it's a success and we blame the individual when there are failures. So it's, it's a, the knowledge and the information and the attributions are, are made in the context of a value system that shapes that information in particular ways. The other part of it, especially in the work uh, in homelessness, but any sort of disempowered group, you know, patients or people, you know, receiving or poor, you know, minority. There is a tremendous power differential about who is defining uh, the problem and how it's being defined. You know, the the knowledge of the people who are homeless and on the street is seldom sought out as experts of their own lived experience, nor is it incorporated into the uh, design of programs or policy. So there's a huge power differential, you know, from the sort of people in authority down and prescriptive to the people that supposedly serving. And we have not done a good job of incorporating the expertise of the people with lived experience that we're designing all of these policies for. Thank you, Sam. Wow, yeah, strong start to the conversation. Um, <laughs> starting off with these small issues. Um, to that point, Sam, of like power and the people who have the control of the narrative, where do you think it is best to direct energy then when we're trying to shift the narrative? Is it towards these people who have the power or is it towards the people who it affects? You know, um, I don't think there's a particular, it's not like a, a dichotomous, uh, you know, it's, it's really, in my experience, in trying to change a system around the homeless system, it's really been more like a movement. And so you need people at each sector, you know, uh, policy, clinicians, finance, people with lived experience, uh, the more voices and perspectives that have a shared point of view based on actual data, because there's a whole other movement that's going on based on propaganda. And like, you know, maybe that's something we, we, have, we need to talk about in this conversation. Like, how do you know the difference, especially in this country, and especially now, and maybe worldwide? Like, how do you know the difference between a fact and, you know, uh, and, and not a fact, you know, the, the propaganda and a fact? But based on facts, based on science, based on randomized controlled trials, based on, you know, the best, as humbling as the evidence is, but based on real evidence, I think the change could best be affected by a movement of, of a community, a consensus of like-minded people pushing in the same direction. How do we effectively get that group consensus and build that community around an issue? And that's open to anyone. Well, you know, like any, go ahead, Cynthia. No, I was going to say, I, I feel like in, in some ways, our, ironically, our isolation and, and, and has, has also contributed to not, not experiencing what others experience or, or sort of having these very um, narrow life experiences um, and therefore not relating to a lot of other individuals and, and sort of their, their life path. And I just think that it would be helpful to really encourage us all to better understand um, other people's realities. Um, I think that, you know, we, we do this so easily when it comes to taking care of our plants or our pets. We look at environments. I mean, that's the first place we go um, with non-human living beings is, you know, is, is there enough light? Is there enough nutrition? Is there enough support? All these things, all of these terms that we use for our plants and our pets, and we rarely use them when we're inquiring about a human need. Um, again, going to, to Sam's point about, you know, it, it's always sort of what did they do wrong, you know, and, and as we said before, that individualism. 
And so I think for the, for the movements, we, we really have to somehow um, create or, or find a way for that empathy to evolve. Um, and because without that, I think that people will just continue to, to judge um, and to question, you know, is this a manipulation? Is this, a, you know, the, again, that level of mistrust that seems to have evolved over time. Um, we have to do something to, to get away from that. And, I, and for me, cultural exposure, which has been my own personal experience of living in different countries, um, has made a huge difference in recognizing uh, there isn't a single way, there isn't um, a, a, a single right way. Um, and, and just learning from others. I, I think, as Sam mentioned about learning from the folks that we're trying to help. I mean, I, you know, when I started going into research, I was a bit shocked that we weren't doing that from the beginning, that we were, that I had colleagues studying populations. They had never stepped into those neighborhoods. They had never been in a shooting gallery if they were studying injection drug users. I just, you know, for me personally, it was hard to understand. And so, so from where I sit, it's really about learning, learning from the people that we're trying to help um, and seeing if we have tools that we can offer and, and seeing if there are things we can learn to then be able to um, help together to partner in that help. So for me, movements is about convergence of, of different perspectives and ideas that can come together for a common goal. I like that idea of convergence. And also your comments made me think about the, the notion of dialectical thinking that you know, individualism and collectivism, there are, there's value in thinking about how each of those applies to various situations. I was in a conversation recently about child abusers, nothing like a light topic or anything. So I, I pardon the lack of sensitivity around that to talk bluntly, but it, it can be true that someone who spanks their child is harming their child, that we, we have evidence of that. And also, if we understand that person with empathy, we understand that story, we understand the, the, the culture, there are a lot of things that go into that person's parenting response. And so I think we can look at it um, with empathy, as you described. And also with that lack of judgment, then we can, if we're curious and we listen to that person's story, um, whether that is someone who's unhoused or someone with HIV, we understand that, yeah, their behaviors they're engaging in, that they're choosing to engage in, that are influenced also by this larger context. So a lot of my, I've, I've gone on TikTok recently, and a lot of the pushback on TikTok are things like, um, well, well, that's not my problem. Well, they're abusing their child. Well, these are child abusers. Um, and if we come at it with this lack of tolerance for that conversation, then are we really going to help people who really need different tools learn how to use those different tools? So it's, I think sometimes we come at it with a zero-sum game, as you talked about initially, um, when we can think about it as many things applying to a situation, which gives us more tools to consider. Nancy, you might have opened a, a whole Pandora's box by bringing up TikTok. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> no, no, you're good. It was <laughs> it was on something I wanted to talk about anyways. Um, Cynthia, you were kind of hinting at it with like, how do we build community and everything? And I think one of the promises of social media and the internet is like, we're going to be all so connected all the time. It's going to be so easy to like build coalitions and movements. And I think it's ignited a lot of that, but the actual follow through has fallen a little flat. Um, and Nancy, to your point of places like TikTok and Instagram, we can start a lot of these really big conversations, but a lot of the nuance is lost and topics become very black and white. And it's hard to build a cohesive group and have these hard conversations. So all that to say, I'm just curious how you are all thinking about social media as a tool to combat these narratives and whether it is worth it. Uh, in the long run, or if it just perpetuates a lot of these issues.
Well, I guess I'll start since I opened Pandora's box. I have found great value in um, social media, in all platforms, because it opens up arguments for a critical reflection on people you would never hear from before. I mean, I'm a college professor. I don't teach high school. And I have people saying to me, you don't teach high school. Clearly, you don't understand. And I have to say, yes, you are exactly right. I don't. Tell me. Tell me. Let's talk. And so then, so then you go and you understand and you and you open yourself up to a level of criticism that's really important. Um, and also, you know, congressional hearings aside, generations of learners are going to social media to answer important questions. So it used to be they would talk to their doctor or go to WebMD or talk to their grandmother. They're going to TikTok and they're asking TikTok questions. <laughs> and if we want them to even have access to some information, it's my view that um, we need to make sure information is available where they're going to be looking. So it's not a ringing endorsement, but I'm tiptoeing into this little platform to see if balancing and 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 shaping that narrative with with sort of an evidence base can be impactful. I mean, I'll I'll jump in and say, you know, I I'm always amazed at the reach of social media, right? That was sort of the biggest change was how many people um you could reach and and, you know, just, it was so different, right? From what we uh, used to have. Um, my, my main issue in general is that we can't not distinguish, um, you know, the intent of the narratives. And so that's, you know, both in terms of the facts, how, how do we make sure that, um, you know, it's not a manipulation, right? In terms of the intent of the narrative. And I think that that is where, I find the most struggle is I love sort of the access. I love, you know, yeah, I can figure out how to repair my car at any point in time um, through YouTube videos and other such things, the sharing of, of knowledge. Um, but in, in some of the dialogues, it's re just really hard. And I, I witness this with, with other colleagues and family members who are influenced. And I get shocked at something that they believe and why they believe it um, that has been all through social media. And so that's when I start to sort of think, gosh, how how do we sort of create um, that same kind of amazing reach and opportunity and dialogue, but that also takes out all of the misinformation and all of the more sort of um, um, manipulative narratives that are out there. Yeah. I'd I think I could just echo that sentiment strongly also that it's not a choice. I mean, we're going to, we have social media and then the question is like, how do we make sense of it? Because, uh, because the pluses are enormous. We've all, we all know in terms of the expanse of communication and knowledge, but in the, and this particular, in these controversial areas, like, you know, involuntary commitment of people who are homeless and mentally ill or, gun control or what actually are the results of the election and who can you trust? It's like, how do we, what do we do? What is the best way of helping to people to distinguish, you know, the, the reality from the fiction? Also, it's not as simple as an individual choice because we have all of these uh, search engines, you know, the, the Meta and and the, the the Google with with all of the algorithms and the coded bias that is sending us messages that are, you know, putting us further and isolating us further from either each other or the truth. So it's not a neutral or benign system, and also we don't have a really good clear way of like distinguishing what is fact from propaganda in that system. So, you know, as a tool, it's um, it's incredibly powerful and it could be good and it could be really destructive. 
Sam, you've kind of posed this question two times now of like, how do we distinguish between propaganda and fact? Um, and social media aside, like, do you have any best practices or advice of how to do that? I, um, you know, I don't know about best practices, but it's, it's an ongoing theme because one of the, one of the things that uh, is constantly uh, at it, 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 a debate in terms of the approach to homelessness is I would say in the homelessness industrial in you know complex of all of the shelter transitional all of those different programs hundreds and hundreds of programs uh, for people who are homeless I would say they fall into two camps in in this area one is uh, and this is the predominant one let's fix the individual you know let's get them sober let's get them into a shelter let's get them into treatment to get them housing ready. And this is, you know, a top-down approach that's based on the assumption that individuals have made wrong choices and we need to set up a structured system to improve them, get them housing ready. And the other predominant approach is let's listen to the person. And when you do that, what happens is they want housing first, not treatment first. They want to get off the street. They want to be safe. And then they want to help. They want help in getting to get along with their lives. So there's like a treatment first and a housing first. And on the housing first, there's lots of data, but people have to look for it. There's research studies, you know, randomized controlled trials, all kinds of literature and, and peer review journals. On the other side, showing that this approach is in fact significantly better. And on the other side, there is um, propaganda, there is persuasive writing, but not much in the way of actual data on effectiveness. So how do we help people uh, be informed about the difference between propaganda and science? You know, it's, um, it's um, you know, through dialogues like this, I think is, you know, it's one way, but it's, it's definitely, I think that is a fundamental challenge in terms of being able to grow a movement, build a consensus and drive an intervention that would take it to scale to actually fix some of these social problems, which, I think are actually fixable and we can do it. But the question is, how do we get there? Yeah, I think you could almost reframe that question then of how do we bridge the gap between research and evidence into applied settings and practice? Um, Cynthia, I'd be curious your thoughts having worked in HIV and AIDS, um, if you think there are any lessons to be learned there. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure if you're talking about the last thing you just said, the research practice or or the social media, but um, you know, uh, on the social media, I, I really think just promoting um, information that we know is valid is is really a responsibility of our of of us as professionals, um, and not enough people do that. I think that that they're um, you know either intimidated, it's it's a generational thing. Um, just understanding how social media is even used. Um, you know, there's a lot of, um, you know, knowledge that is being lost, I think, because of the lack of folks engaged. And, and so you can, you know, sort of find bias there. And I, I think trying to promote um, good information and having more people do that um, and, and acknowledging that some may not believe it or not may not trust it. So again, that empathy, even of those that may oppose what you're putting forth, but at, but at least doing both, promoting stuff that we know is important and and valid, and acknowledging that not everyone might agree, and and suggesting, as Sam says, go find the information. Um, here are our, our, our sources, but but it's it's hard, you know, in this um, ideological context that we're in now, it's it's really hard because people will say, well, science, you don't believe science, you know, um, so so it's really difficult. Um, but on your second point, this, this sort of how do we use then science for practical purposes? I think this goes back to our earlier conversation about engaging with those that we are trying to help through the science that we engage in or that we learn from. And um, how do we make sure that what we're trying to learn is actually of interest? Um, you know, a lot of folks, um, will say, well, some people do research for research sake. Um, others is a separation of, you know, research for discovery, which is really important, you know, learning what we don't know. And then other things is sort of doing research, again, applied research 
to help, you know, whether it be at the individual, you know, community systems level, how do we find the best and most efficient ways to do things or to, to create certain goals? And again, for me, that's that's the partnership, right? That is the, um, we need each other's uh, viewpoints. Um, those who have seen me do um, HIV presentations, I almost always used a particular image of a train track. And I um, really see sort of the research side and the applied side is simply looking out uh, the different sides of the train. We're all trying to get to the same destination, but we have a very different view. And until we can bring those views together, we're not gonna know what we missed um, because I can only look through one side of the window, somebody else is looking through the other. And if we can bring those views together, I think that's how we find the best research to practice. Um, research is done very controlled, um, you know, laboratories for, for basic science, but but also in randomized controlled trials that Sam was mentioning, we control a lot. That's the whole point of the experiment, right? But when we go to the real world, a lot of the implementation science work that's happening now, what do we have to really look at? Um, and so I think that as, as researchers, we don't know what that is. We really depend on our community partners to tell us what they need to learn, what they want to learn. Um, you know, early on, I came up with this word called the Mort syndrome, which are the areas of difference between researchers and um, our community members. And it stood for money, ownership, rigor, and time. And these are things that are very different. If you're the scientist, you get a lot of money, you own the data, you have to be very rigorous, you take five years to finish a study. Um, if you're running a community, organization, which I also had the privilege of doing, you have very little money, you don't own most things that you're dealing with. Um, it's the rigor is about the the clinical, what you're offering to your to your community or to your patients. And time is immediate. You don't have five years to answer a question. So those are very different experiences and values. And again, coming together is the only way we can figure out how we can apply sort of that scientific lens to real world situations. Those are some really nice comments. I like that framing. Um, I found too that when I approach public health, like with an entrepreneur hat on, I'm able to do that work much better because I feel like sometimes in public health, we, we think a bit small, and we run around with our solutions that we've concocted in our laboratories and our research facilities. And we come up with solutions to problems. And we, and we take that hammer and we run around and we look for all the nails and we try to sell people on this hammer that we came up with. And the more we can sort of set down our hammer and run around to the, to the purchaser of our solutions, if you will, and, and say sort of, as a valued customer, what kind of solutions do you need? What is your lived experience with this issue, this problem? What value do you have in solving this problem? And then we might find that our solutions are, maybe they're a little bit like a hammer, but kind of not. Um, and so I really appreciate this translation, dissemination, implementation field. I co-direct the Community Engagement Core of a Center for Innovation and Child Maltreatment. And so these bi-directional relationships between community partners and academics, those are really, really critical. And also there's power that exists there. Um, and I have found that really hearing the stories and the narrative from people who um, are addressing this problem from a little different angle they want a different solution. Um, and so I, I think, you know, you're bringing up a really good point. Like we have, there's evidence and then there's practice. So many times people are practicing things that don't have much evidence. And then there's some, some things that are, have tons of evidence that people aren't practicing. So those levers, whether they're financial or political or whatever, um, those are the ones we have to be really sensitive to. Um, so I think your your point is really well taken. Sort of this this gap. Um, it, it it's not just about how we get over the gap, it's but how do we fill that in 
and really take a different lens in the development of solutions to even begin with. Sam, I'd be curious your thoughts, kind of building off Nancy's point of uh, housing first is evidence-based. Like you said, it is a very effective solution, yet it has been such an uphill battle getting it implemented correctly in communities because of all these levers, because it is politicized, because of funding, X, Y, Z. Um, what are your thoughts on how, how do we manipulate those levers to get these solutions in the real world? Well, well, I think Nancy's point about uh, the hammer and uh, the nails maybe is a, is a good analogy for this, because even though you have something that is an evidence-based practice, it's still, you can't just go to a new community and say, hey, listen, we have an evidence-based practice, you know, we developed it here, and this is what you guys should be doing. You have to understand the needs of the community and translate or adapt the principles and practices of that evidence-based practice to the community that you're work working with. So that uh, each, each, each uh, solution is kind of um, tailor-made and, and locally adapted because if it's, if it's sort of imposed from the outside, it won't have either the um, embracing of the, of the local community or putting in uh, the sort of things you need to sustain the practice uh, over time. So it's, um, you know, I think that the evidence base is, is helpful in terms of getting people interested in the idea. This is an idea that's been tested other places and it works and it might work here. So that definitely gives you an advantage in terms of, of being able to have a persuasive argument. But ultimately, you know, uh, it's um, it, it has to be, uh, implemented at the community level with the with the resources available at that level, with the people who are going to be operating the program. And so it might look a little different because the way it was tested in one place may not have the same uh, kind of resource-rich environment as the next place you're working at. But even with all that, in, in sort of dissemination implementation research, you can still have a pretty consistent and decent model that works across communities uh, although you have a wider band of how it looks across these different communities. And Sam, if I could, you know, add to that and ask you as well, because I think that one of the things I know just as, as behavioral scientists um, is that we get stuck with thinking we found a solution. Um, and, um, you know, we had all these evidence-based interventions and, and da, 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 as if nothing changes. And so for me, um, my personal challenge over the years um, has been the fact that in the real world, things change constantly. And um, one evidence-based solution is evidence-based solution at that moment um, and not necessarily can be sustained over time. Um, so I'd be curious even to think about, you know, because I think, um, as as public health professionals to to be reminded, I mean, in some ways, public health knows that more than anywhere um, that things are constantly changing. That's how we've you know have to track you know new outbreaks, et cetera, et cetera. What's going on? But we don't seem to carry that in some of the programs and interventions that get created that we think should look should exist for 10, 20 years and still be effective. I'd be curious to know. Sam, for you, because I would assume that the homelessness situation has changed so dramatically over the last 20 years in terms of what what folks are sort of both dealing with and and the lack of choices as they in some ways get worse and policies get worse. Um, how do we deal with that? How do we deal with the constant movement and the constant need for a readjustment um, to, to stay effective? Right. Well, it's a great question. I have to say, in the area of homelessness, you're right that it's been changing continuously. But strangely, it's been changing all in one direction. Like, it's just been getting worse and bigger, right? So one of the things about this evidence-based intervention is that there has to be almost a starting point. I, I don't see this as a, as a top-down implementation because it starts with a community wanting to do something about the problem. People say, you know, this problem is getting worse. We have more people on the street. And everywhere you go, this problem exists. So you go in and you 
discuss the problem that you're trying to address. You don't come in with the intervention. You come in with what have you tried and what is the interventions that have worked here and what hasn't worked. And you already know, because there are people on the street or in and out of shelters, that this, this particular group of people has not been well served. So there has to be an acknowledgement that we've tried to do this and it hasn't worked. And then there's a, a readiness to try something different with this group. So it the, uh, the interest in the intervention comes from the ground up with that acknowledgement. And that makes it uh, you know, much more feasible and easier to kind of have people's buy-in in addressing the, the issue. Uh, there are subtle changes, like uh, the types of substance abuse, uh, you know, like we, you know, the opioid fentanyl epidemics and you know, uh, Narcan, other harm reduction things. I mean, there are sort of almost technical clinical changes over time that have happened, you know, from crack to fentanyl now, but 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 the overall overarching sort of principles and practices have remained more or less uh, the same, uh, and the challenges have been more or less the same, and, and the solutions have remained effective throughout. You know that's the thing, and now an additional sort of selling point is to say to people, you know, a city your size has just ended homelessness. Milwaukee, for example, has has brought down the number of people on the street using this housing first approach to 17 in a city of 700,000. So it's like, we can do this. And people are like, oh, really? Like, what did Milwaukee do? So, you know, it's the evidence, it's the uh, pointing to other examples that are similar and people can identify it to. It's, um, it's those kinds of factors, I think, that, that help in the dissemination and, and adaptation. That's a really nice um, example. I run a program called Support Over Silence for Kids. And the example from, from parenting and, and child welfare is that, you know, when you see a caregiver and a child struggling in public and you're not sure kind of what to do because there's this, you know, stressful situation and everybody turns and looks and everybody says, well, what do we do? Well, for the longest time, we didn't know what to do. So we have this nice little program called Supportive or Silence that's in fact evidence-based, if you you know use some quotes here. Because what do we mean by evidence-based? You know, we've got a bunch of studies saying that it is effective in achieving particular outcomes. We can point to a hospital who used this approach and really, um, you know, satisfaction scores went up and sense of community went up and bystanders know how to be supportive to their community. But has it helped lower rates of child abuse? Um, and we don't know the answer to that question yet. And I think sometimes then we learn new stuff. But we learn about the neurobiology of, of stress. We learn about fight or flight. We learn how to take those, you know, the decade of the brain and incorporate those into our behavioral intervention. So now our program looks a little different because we have this an element onto it that we have used to address, Cynthia, to your point, sort of a contemporary understanding of new knowledge. Um, and I think, you know, as we train students, as we talk to community members, that's an important point. You know, we throw around this like evidence-based word a lot without really clarifying what we mean sometimes. And um, I, I think that's an important distinction too. Um, what level of rigor is required for us to be happy with the causal impact our programs have and fund those programs um, attempting to achieve particular outcomes? And that's always an interesting dialogue to have um, because sometimes it's very, very counterintuitive that the programs we think are going to have big impacts because they sort of make sense to us end up being almost harmful. Or sometimes we move one lever, but the another level lever goes down. And so thinking about the system as a whole, just because something is evidence-based in achieving one outcome doesn't mean that it hasn't caused a whole host of other harms that we need to keep our eye on. So I think when we when we talk about science and promoting science, we have to be cautious about even the context of that conversation. I think all yeah, of these are kind I, of, oh, sorry, Sam, continue. No, go ahead. 
I just I, wanted to say something about evidence base, or if you're going to move to another topic. No, but, please say something. But, but 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 to Nancy's point, which you know makes me a little nervous because you know she's willing to challenge like what is an evidence base, and I think well we can have a consensus about what an evidence base is. It's like studies done by different researchers in different settings and achieving the same results. You know, for me that's always been sort of uh, the standard. You know, the randomized controls file as a as a gold standard and not to say that it doesn't have other uh unanticipated consequences in other areas i totally agree with you but i also wanted to point out that there's something else that about evidence-based practice that worries me because I, I mean even though I, I i think it's our best shot and and to mm -hmm. and as cynthia said you know like be responsible for disseminating as much valid information as possible take that on as as, as a part of our work. Uh, thank you for that. I, I, it's changed my thinking about it already. But there's something so about evidence. does that mean evidence... you're going to start your own YouTube channel, Sam? I don't know about that, but I'm <laughs> definitely going to like, you know, tweet more and put things okay, out. Okay, okay. You know, I mean, I, I, you know, I, you know, it's like a motivational interview. You got to go stage by stage. <laughs> right, <you know>? right. <laughs> but I, no, but I think, but it's an important thing and I, and I don't do it enough, you know, and I think, and I think uh, it's a wake up call. Thank you. But the thing about evidence-based practice, which I find a little restrictive, you know, to agree with you, Nancy, is once something becomes evidence-based, like, oh, this is the evidence-based practice. But it's like, how did, I, how did we get to an evidence-based practice? We started taking people off the streets and putting them into apartments. It was crazy to do that. It was like, why would anyone take that chance? Because we didn't know what else to do. It's like, that was, you know, that's what they wanted. We are going to go client driven. We start doing that. And then the whole thing turns out to be like quite spectacularly successful. And then we test it and it's like, oh yeah, this is like really much better than doing other things. But let's not forget it was in the spirit of complete like innovation and not knowing what to do, you know, and now if you're going to harness everybody with, oh, you got to do evidence-based practice, isn't that like a buffer to creativity and to kind of like thinking out of the box? It's like, let's not make evidence-based practice a coffin, you know, let's make it a springboard for going forward into other dimensions. And, and also evident, collecting the evidence comes at a cost. And, and collecting the evidence can often be harmful to the people we're trying to help with our programs, for instance. So there's, there's a trade-off even to establishing the evidence base to begin with, but I digress. <laughs> I was just going to note from an outside perspective, obviously not, you know, public health background as all of you, but I think just reframing, Sam, to your point of you got to start somewhere where it's not evidence-based and just be iterative in your testing and pursue these ideas that might feel a little crazy at the time. And then when you get that win, communicating that win, I think you all touched on that of like, Sam, talking about Milwaukee as a huge win. And I, I'd be curious your thoughts. Uh, are, I don't know if we're communicating that broadly enough. I feel like I always talk about Milwaukee as a huge win and people are like, I've never even heard about that. I thought it would be bigger news that Milwaukee has effectively ended chronic homelessness. And I feel like I'm the only one who knows sometimes. Um, but that is a huge win and we need to communicate it more broadly. Um, so I'd be just open it up to all of you if there are any specific wins in the narratives that you're focusing on that you think we should be talking about more or should learn from or just be just want to reiterate as a win. Well, I'll jump in because I certainly, you know, when I started the Health Equity Institute in 2006, health equity was not being used as a term, um, if you can believe that, <laughs> um, since it seems to be everywhere today. And for me, that was a huge, just an observational win, just, just to see that our nomenclature can be changed. Um, for me, when I first um, named it the Health Equity Institute, people were like, oh, you mean health disparities, right? And I'm like, actually, no. Um, we, we already know about health disparities. We already know that there are differences. I'm talking about solutions um, and finding solutions. And so for me, it was it was a win to to see over time that people started to at least, even if they didn't understand the concept, they were willing 
to use it. And and I, this sort of goes back, I think, to you know these iterative processes and what are we comfortable with and our high expectations of each other as professionals. Um, and it's okay that people don't yet, because it's still true, don't yet understand how to think about health equity. Um, but the fact that they're starting to talk about it, that we're starting to talk about being in a system, being in a context, um, and therefore trying to understand beyond our own individual behaviors, the sort of old medical model where you got a disease because you were doing a certain behavior and that's what caused the disease, right? This is, and, and so now we're saying, oh, wait, but maybe something else caused your behavior. You're eating terrible food because you don't have access to fresh food, right? I mean, we, we're starting to, to change those narratives uh, on a more regular basis. Um, and that's a really exciting win that I, I'm not uh, saying was created by me, but it, it's a societal win that we're making that shift, um, even if people are still uncomfortable or thinking that they're gonna lose something as a consequence. But the fact that we're even thinking that way, the fact that COVID within the first few weeks were articles about populations that were being more affected and why that had to do with social determinants, who the frontline workers were, access to testing, we immediately looked at that. In HIV, it took us 20 years to say, oh, people of color have been uh, actually affected from the beginning in a disproportionate way. Oops, we didn't look at that early on. Um, and suddenly in COVID, we looked at it immediately. That for me was a tremendous win, just from that narrative perspective. You know, I think about that, that uh, the disaster in our response to, um, to HIV AIDS was because of government inaction, you know, really purposeful in a way. And how different COVID was because the, the response there was government action actually helped save a lot of lives. I mean, we lost far too many, of course, but the government was so strong. I mean, especially in this issue of like homelessness, suddenly shelters and people on the street were being put into hotels or motels like immediately people were yelling you got to get the homeless into a place to live right away it's like i've been saying that for 30 years why didn't anyone listen to me it's like we should have called homelessness covid and then we would have had, you know end of homelessness right away but it was like the government's response was like 180 degrees different in those two instances because it wasn't about gay people and drug users it was about everybody possibly getting sick, right? So it's the, the containment of the homelessness, I view as being because people were afraid that they were the conduits of disease, right? As right. we did with other populations in HIV. So still the the intent for me um, was still uh, questionable yes, um, yes. in, in, right. in the motivation. If, right, in the motivation. because if, if, yeah. if too many people who are homeless got ill, where would be the emergency room beds for everybody? Still, it was a very different response, maybe with the same bad intent. Well, well again, I, I think not bad as much as our sort of, it seems to be the intuitive response, you know, of protecting oneself over others, mm -hmm. which again goes so against our public health right. intent. Right, protecting oneself. But who is that oneself? I have a bit of a different view on that, um, given that I'm working with kids in particular, because in in my, from my perspective, um, we also did a very poor job protecting children during that time. And we were very quick to implement strategies with very little evidence. And now we're finding out little evidence entirely that harmed children in ways that we will be paying for for a long time. And we haven't invested enough resources to really figure out what this response should look like. And so I, I, I appreciate the perspective that you are coming from. Um, from where I sit, um, I feel like many teachers, parents, and kids have been at this point very abandoned because they they assumed the cost of keeping the adults healthy and also the emotional burden of doing so, which was really problematic for a whole host of kids. So when we talk about the narrative, 
that's some of the narrative that we are reeling from, I think. I'd be curious because that's, you know, both very valid perspectives, but how do we kind of remedy that, especially thinking about training the next generation of public health professionals? Like, how do we keep both and all audiences and all of the public in mind and navigate all these different directions? Yeah. It's my view that we do this all the time, but we don't call it out. You know, I talk with my students a lot about, you know, we need we need sun protection and vitamin D. We need helmets on bikes and physical activity. We might need bars on windows to protect from theft, but we're also looking at fire prevention. We are constantly weighing the levers that we choose. And Sam's point earlier, that solutions need to be tailor-made. We need to be talking to people tactically about, you know, their vitamin D versus their outside. These, these risks, they vary a lot. And we, like I said earlier, we had these blunt instruments that we were using that um, we, we use without a lot of the, the people at the table and those voices that we needed to have. And, and I only learned this by like meeting with parent groups of people who were parenting children with disabilities, um, parenting children who were um, struggling with emotional issues and mental health struggles. These things were very, very real. And now we're seeing these this escalation of these issues that, you know, as public health folks, you know, in large part, we're not really equipped to be dealing with. Like, like Sam was saying earlier, if we would have just called this COVID, you know, so I'm trying to rally this post-pandemic energy around this health threat um, with as much enthusiasm as we address the earlier um, pandemic response. And that's a challenge because you see people saying, well, it was three years ago. So what? They missed their graduation. Why is that a problem? I don't understand that. They're they're apathetic. They're not motivated. Send them to the principal's office. That's the wrong model. Well, I, I totally agree with you, Nancy, that we, first of all, we're still dealing with consequences of COVID and we will continue to do so. I, I would also say that that part of what we have to continually remember is, is is the humility of, of not knowing things, mm -hmm. you know, accepting that we don't know sometimes. So that rapid response, you're absolutely right. We just assume, oh, you know what? Kids don't seem to be getting sick. Let's not worry about them. Not thinking, of course, um, about the consequences of just the isolation, the, you know, all, all the measures that we had to take at the time that felt necessary. Um, and yet, again, I think as we just where we started the conversation is how do we stay humble in our knowledge in, in acknowledging that our knowledge is so limited, and that we have to react um, expeditiously in a situation of a pandemic, um, as best we can, and then keep readjusting as we learn more and more. And this is true, right, in any disease, we want to look at over time, you know, some diseases we're still treating with 100 year old remedies because we haven't found anything uh, new or hasn't been investigated. Other things, you know, like an epidemic require this rapid response. I didn't, you know, as Sam mentioned earlier, we, we made so many mistakes in HIV. Um, and, and again, I think we've tried to learn as new epidemics have come up, what, what are processes or things that we can do differently. But the continued expectation that our knowledge is deep enough to always lead us to the right conclusions is, I think, a place where we have to really deep, dig deep in our own expectations, both as professionals and just as people. Um, uh, we, we just don't have that much knowledge about um, things. And as new things come up, you know, we need to find more knowledge. But again, um, just you know, having that that humility is, is so critical for us to move forward and not be so hard on each other when a message has been given that later uh, appears to be wrong, um, but it wasn't intended to right. in the beginning, right? So just really hard stuff. 
particularly yeah. focused and targeted at public health professionals, by the way, which I, I just still breaks my heart. I guess, you know, to your point, Nancy, about the depth of knowledge, I don't think we will, uh, we don't have that kind of depth of knowledge, but I, I guess I want to put in a plug for the uh, practitioner researcher model in, in public mm. health, you know, it's like, right. we really, that's the only, I mean, for me, anyway, you know, clinical community psychologist, to me, what that always meant was, whatever harebrained idea we were test, trying out, we would test it, there would be always this sense of let's evaluate what we're doing, not only react immediately to the emergency of what we need to do, but always have a, a the, the evaluative perspective also in mind. And I think that's what will help us to build the kind of knowledge base over time. It's, it's a constantly increasing pool of information, but it requires a mindset. I mean, there's, there's so much money, for example, in my business, homelessness, Recently, I was reading $10.7 billion goes to shelters every year in this country, $10.7 billion. But the fact of the matter is that only 50% of the shelter beds are used. You know, it's like, wh where where is the evaluation from year one to year two? And why are we throwing money away? So I, I'm just saying, you know, let's try all kinds of things, but let's evaluate. So we're building some real knowledge as we go. Yeah, that Shape. speaks to even the social media part or even the entrepreneurial part that we do these little A-B tests and we generate knowledge quickly and we get feedback quickly through social media. Because I would argue that we, that we did have pretty deep, deep depth of knowledge. Um, and it was the same thing with the knowledge. We had knowledge we weren't using. We have beds that aren't being used. You know, in my line of work, we have, we have, um, we did a lot of work at one point to give families pack and play so they would have sleep environments for their children. Those weren't being used. You know, there's there are a lot of kind of stories where we have the right solution, but the adoption of that solution isn't as great as we would expect. So there are some other gaps we can be can be thinking about. And that's a, a great note to start wrapping up on this idea of try new things, be iterative and communicate those back out. I think that's just such a core thing that we need to be doing everywhere, um, but particularly in public health. But to wrap up, um, we always have one last question, which we stole from the great Ezra Klein. Um, but I'd be curious if each of you have a recommendation for a book or a podcast or um, maybe like a documentary um, that you would just recommend to the audience? Uh, the best uh, thing I've read on homelessness uh, recently is uh, this book by Greg Colburn and Clayton Page Aldrin called Homelessness is a Housing Problem. They look at uh, national data, not like the person on the street, national data of mental illness and addiction and homelessness. And it turns out there is no correlation at the national level or the state level like Medicaid data between mental illness or addiction and homelessness because so many more millions of people with mental illness are not homeless or with addiction. So it definitely, and, and the one significant finding uh, in in the in their massive data set is the only thing that predicts homelessness reliably and significantly is the cost of rent in the city. It's a great book and really well done. And there's one podcast, 99% Invisible. It's a five-part series by a reporter named Katie Mingle, where she goes through kind of the options for individuals and she interviews individuals and families that are going through the homeless system in California, 99% invisible. It's called According to Need by Katie Mingle. Such a great series. And if I remember correctly, I think you're featured on that, Sam, aren't you? Well, I'll jump in. You know, um, uh, I'm going to give folks uh, a recommendation. One is a novel. <laughs> you know, I know that particularly those professionals that might be watching this are having to study a lot. Um, but uh, it's it's from 2018, Rebecca Mackay, The Great Believers, um, and it's about the HIV pandemic, but it's written in such a way of 
different lives, how people are impacted and sort of goes back to our earlier conversations of empathy and sort of understanding um, what folks uh, were experiencing at the time. Um, similarly is this very, um, it's, it's a great course, one of the great courses um, called The Black Death, um, which is by Dr. Dorsey Armstrong. And it is a 24 lectures of 30 minutes each. And it the reason I find it so interesting, it, it is a bit, um, it took me a bit to stay with it because uh, it felt a little slow. It's a, um, you know, she's actually a medieval literature professor. So a very different way of, of teaching. Um, and yet over time, it just was such an amazing way to think about history, the 1300s and how we were dealing with a pandemic then and what happened, how people reacted, what the policies happened, how we ignored them, how, um, and, and it just, it's just that reminder of history repeating itself. And so I just found it um, very interesting to hear that kind of historical perspective in the context of today um, and seeing how much we've moved forward and how much we are the same. So I uh, just found it interesting. So again, the Black Death, uh, the world's most devastating plague, uh, Dorsey Armstrong. Uh, she's a professor at Purdue. These are all such good ideas. I was like editing my list as you two were talking. <laughs> I, I don't know. All right, in the spirit of narrative, um, I think one of the most useful things to do and think about is mindfulness. And so there are some great apps, um, free apps, paid apps on mindfulness. I think this is like the, the decade of the brain and knowing how our brains work is hugely important. Uh, Chris Palmer just came out with a book called Brain Energy, think connecting mental health with all sorts of mitochondrial function. Um, Andrew Huberman, the Huberman Lab podcast is great. Um, although he could say what he needs to say in you know fewer minutes, but we'll let that slide. And then also I'm a behavioral scientist and I'm so into all our behavioral models and yet, Learning more about the nervous system has been very helpful. So there's a book called Beyond Behaviors that's really helpful. Alfie Cohn's early work on, um, you know, the punished by rewards and, and those kinds of things are really useful. And I offer these just in the spirit of like shifting this narrative so that we understand each other better and the humanness that comes with our choices and our systems and the context in which we live. Um, and so those would be among my few, but I could ramble. I mean, we're all, as, as you asked that question, did you notice we all like looked around at our bookshelves and like wondered which books to pull up? Um, but that's a lovely question. Thank you for asking. <laughs> Thank you all for those answers. I will definitely add them all to my list. Um, but we are over time already. And I know I have a million more questions I would love to ask each and every one of you. Um, but this was just a great start to get everyone thinking about how do we challenge narratives and think about public health and health and applications differently. Um, so thank you all so much. And on behalf of Orange Sparkle Ball and the Rollins School of Public Health, um, thank you for everyone watching and listening. And I really hope you take all these lessons to heart. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Sophie. Thank you. Nice Cynthia, Nancy, everyone. great to meet you. Yeah. A pleasure. Well.